Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Mathia Vargas and this is Olas We Are series. It's a series of panels exploring and educating on the diversity within the Latinx community. In these panels, we wanna highlight artists from across the Latinx diaspora in the hopes of educating the industry and proving once and for all that we are not a monolith. This month, we celebrate women. And what better way to close Women's History Month here at Ola than by featuring and celebrating some of the women who are part of our Ola community. I'm so excited to welcome our board members and colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us. Here we have tonight Blanca Camacho, who sits on Ola's board of directors. Blanca is an actress and narrator whose credits include In the Heights on Broadway, Law and Order, audiobooks, animation, radio, TV ads, ADR looping. What doesn't she do? Thank you for joining us, Blanca. Thank you. Thank you. Inma Heredia, who you may already know since she served as um, the host of our Ola Spotlights, which I hope you're tuning in for. They're fantastic. Inma is a theater and film actress, a singer, a flamenco dancer, and creator of her one woman show. We also tonight is joining us Gabriela Garcia. Gabriela serves on our board of directors. She is an actress, a choreographer, a master teacher, and co founder of Revolución Latina, which we love over here at Ola. And finally, board of director member, the incredible Isolda Peguero. Isolda has had an extensive career in broadcasting. She served as a national correspondent for Telemundo for over 25 years. My mom loves you. And she's also a member of Ola's board of directors, right? And has transitioned into voiceover work and audiobook narration. Welcome, welcome, you incredible ladies. How are you all tonight? Hello, everybody. Great to be with all of you, amazing women. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for having us. <laughs> Thank you, of course, for joining us. So I always start our panels with a little bit of the statistics, and then we jump into conversations about um, your careers. And, and so I want to celebrate you tonight. But first, let's talk about why it's important to talk about women in TV, film, and media, and specifically Latin women. Um, historically, we haven't had much representation, right? But things are looking up. You know, in some of my research, um, the statistics um, have, that are showing that we are coming up in more speaking roles on film and more protagonistic roles on film, um, especially in streamers. These streamers are doing an amazing job of including um, incorporating inclusivity into their stories. Black, Latin, and Asian women have all had increased presence on camera. But some of the places where I see that there is a new for, room for improvement and there has been a little bit of a downturn has been behind the camera in roles as directors and writers, producers, cinematographers, and executive producers. Um, major characters have increased in streamers and they've increased as well behind the camera, which is really exciting to see. But we have some things that we're still working towards overcoming. You know, one of the things that came up in my research was that um, a study came out in 2014, and it said that since 1996, about 69% of female Latin roles um, were for like made kind of roles um, or roles where women were undereducated or perhaps um, having issues or were low economic status. And that is changing. Um, the proof of that is the incredible women that are on our panel who are creators, our content creators and artists who are working towards dispelling those stereotypes that have been prevalent in media. I would love to hear about your journeys. Blanca, you started in theater on stage and musical theater and you're a mother as well. So you're balancing motherhood, theater, TV, audiobooks. So talk to us about this journey and these transitions. Um, well, particularly because um, this is Women's History Month and that's the focus of this particular panel, um, it's something that um, being a mom, I mean, being a parent and being an artist is difficult, but the specific challenges that um, confront people who give birth are, are a little more uh, in depth because it's a change in our body and this being... Um, an industry where looks are everything or a, a big part, it's, uh, it presents a particular, very particular challenge. Now for me, I had already started doing voiceover work. Um, so by the time I was having children, um, 
I was all, I already had a foot established in, in uh, the voiceover field. As a matter of fact, I was calling from the hospital on my way to the maternity ward, having to cancel a gig that I had the next day because I was <laughs> like, sorry, Wendy, I'm not going to be able to make it. I can tell you I'm not going to be able to make it. Um, but once you, you know, so that presents a certain challenge. Luckily, um, technology has changed. And especially in the last two years, because so much of our work is being done from home, from the waist up. So that does provide, you know, a short term, there's been a slight change in that. Um, for me, being a mom and trying to juggle being um, a full-time artist, um, there was a lot of economic challenges as well, because suddenly the thing that was my first love, which was theater, um, was not as was not as doable anymore, because unlike some of the other fields that are available to us, it's the one that pays the most, the least, and requires the most amount of hours that you log in. You're doing a show, you're rehearsing six days a week, you're in performance, you've got eight performances a week or whatever, and so for me, I found that financially, it was a lot better for me to stick to doing radio. TV voiceovers because you could go in and out, you know, doing voiceovers. You go to a studio, you're out in an hour or two in your home. And in those two hours, you will net the same as if you spent a whole week in a rehearsal room. Um, so that was a, a big reason why I wasn't doing as much theater. On the positive side, once you become a parent, you are so focused. You've never been so focused in your life because your time is so limited. So you don't have the luxury, let's say if you're doing theater and I, you know, I would allow myself the luxury of doing theater every few years to feed my soul, even if it wasn't filling my bank account. But I found that I was so much more focused in the rehearsal room because when I got home, I didn't have the time to go over the script 15 times. I didn't have time in the rehearsal room to ask questions 15 times or try it 15 different ways. For me, it was a more streamlined way of working where I had to use my rehearsal time to make decisions, come to conclusions, and go from there and tackle the next question that I might have regarding a performance or a script or a role. So I found that I became much more focused, something I, I was not expecting that motherhood would affect my creative process wow. in that way. But because you have to compartmentalize, uh, if I may, as a mother, you have to juggle so many things. And we women are masters at being multitaskers. Mm -hmm. So you uh, most likely, when you become a mother, you really learn how to compartmentalizing how to divide your time to make it effective and continue your life, especially such a career as demanding as entertainment. Absolutely. I mean, and the other thing that I found surprising was that I didn't realize how just having my children would force me to make decisions about my career, not necessarily for me, and I'm not talking about the financial things, but as a role model for them. Um, I have my own Achilles heel when it comes to auditioning and that Achilles heel is singing. It scares me. <laughs> you know, ultimately I ended up on a stage on Broadway singing in front of 1300 people every show, but that didn't, that doesn't mean that before that moment, I wasn't afraid. And so, I mean, give me a, a script to cold read, not a problem, but that was my Achilles heel. And so once my children were a little older, every few years, someone would remember, oh, Blanca sings, let's call her in. And I would be like, oh, really? You had to remember that, huh? <laughs> but, and I'm not, even, I'm not even exaggerating, but I would say to my kids, so I would do this, not for me, but for them. And I would say, hey, I got this audition and they're asking me to sing. And you know, that makes me nervous, but all I can do is try my best. So I would go to these auditions, not for me, because it scared me, but because I wanted to be a role model for my children to try to overcome their fears so that whenever something might frighten them, 
whenever something might challenge them, that they would say, well, but I can try and I can just try to do my best. And that's how I ended up at Heights because I got a call to come in. I, I went in, I was hired the last possible day ever on this job. Um, everyone was going off for Christmas vacation and then we were coming back to rehearse. And that's when I got hired. There's not even anyone left to talk to the day I got hired for that show. Because, you know, again, I was like the last one they remember to call. And I said to my kids, I'm going to try to do my best. And I didn't hear for a couple of days. And my kids said, oh, so I guess you didn't get it, mommy, huh? But you tried your best. And I knew that I had gotten it, but I saved it because it was Christmas. And on Christmas <laughs> Day, I gave them each a Heights baseball cap. And that's oh, how they found amazing. out. You know, but see, I, but this takes it off of you somewhat when when your your energy is channeled towards something else, whatever that is, whether it's a child, whether it's um, an achievement that you have to make. You know, I think sometimes we each have to choose a path that makes us comfortable. You know, say to ourselves, give ourselves whatever pep talk will help us with whatever our individual challenges are to move to that next step. And all the ladies on this panel have made transitions in their careers, as you'll hear tonight, and they each chose a path that would be a positive one that left them feeling empowered to move forward and at least strive to achieve. Absolutely. Flowers. Um, I worked with Blanca a couple of times. I've had the pleasure of being on the receiving end of your powerful performances. Um, and I remember the first time we were, we were sitting across the table and you talked about motherhood and being an artist. And I, the thing that filled my heart that in that moment and still right now makes me a little bit emotional is how powerful it is to watch your mother self-actualize and what that must have been like for your kids, you know? Um, a lot of people in our community, are, our parents are immigrants. And so, you know, our parents are coming here to self-actualize in one way, but maybe they had dreams they left behind. And so to see someone be able to do that, and I would love to be a mom one day and hope that I could instill those kinds of things in my kids is really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> and, and you can do it. I mean, I just have to say to all the men and women out here who are thinking of becoming parents and might be wondering, how do I do this? Just do it. Because once you take that step, my God, you'll become brilliant. And I'm not saying that I am, but you'll, you'll figure it out because you must, because you've taken that step to, to become a parent and you, you will just figure it out, however that is, and, and, and you'll make it work. Absolutely. Well, Isola, speaking of, you, you, Blanca, you spoke about transitions and Isola, you've made some incredible transitions. And um, I'm, I know, okay, for Blanca, one of the things that scares you a little bit is singing on, and singing on camera. And I wonder what came up for you as you're making a transition from, from, journal, from being a journalist for so long into artistry um, and what that's like. And just introduce yourself and let us know how amazing you are. <laughs> No, I I, I, um, I was just uh, nodding inside my head because I can't really relate to what Blanca was saying because when I started as a journalist, I was a new mother and I was um, I had a new baby. My I had the luxury that my mother took care of her while I was covering City Hall first for a newspaper and then because I moved from radio from print to radio and then television. But I think my journey as a broadcaster people thought that it was going to be easy because they think that when you are used to being in front of the camera and speak in front of a microphone that you have it that you're, you're you have an easy path towards it and nothing further than the truth because i have to really educate myself in the role of acting i have to take improv class acting lessons i have to uh, take voiceover classes um have coaches um, attend every workshop and their mothers. And finally, after five years, when I decided what am I gonna do with my life when my journey at Telemundo was over, I heard a voice saying voiceover because people always recognize me more for the sound of my voice from 
by looking at me. And so, plus I came from radio and I always had a passion to, to just speak and tell stories. And in a way, voiceover, you're telling the story being in a way of a commercial or in a longer uh, format than when you are narrating an audio book. So for me, it was a lot of work and all of a sudden, People thought that I was going to have an easy path because I came from the world of broadcasting, nothing further than the truth. After five years, I'm starting to see the results of all those years preparing myself to reinvent myself in what I call my second act. And I feel very proud of it because I started a new career when I was um, 56 to 57 years old, and I'm now 61. And it's like I have done everything. I have a uh, been a teacher, I uh, have taught communication, I have been a coach for communications, I have a, I have done theater. I'm my most refined moment talking about being afraid, even though I'm used to speak in front of audiences all the time and do live transmissions. When I have to do a monologue in front of a real audience, I was a nurse rack and I have to re keep, keep re repeating myself, Isolda, you have done uh, interviews uh, with uh, head of states. You have done interviews with uh, entertainers like the, um, my dear friend here, Gabriela Garcia, who I met when I was a correspondent in Telemundo Network. And I went to interview her for her role in Chicago. And at Telemundo, we're, we're all like so excited and proud that a Mexican was gonna be having playing this role in Chicago. And it was a big deal. And after that, the journey began. And, we are crossing path again through Ola and through the entertainment world. We even coincided in, with and the audio books. The heights. <laughs> That's right. So I one thing that I would say is that I'm always been very self uh, assured. Like I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of trying new things. And I guess that's why I have been always very uh, daring in a good positive way. That I'm not afraid of trying new things. And I truly believe that we human beings have many talents. We cannot be just um, encasillar. How do you say that in English? We cannot be classified. Look, I'm a journalist and that's what I'm gonna be for the rest of my life. No, we have so many talents, so many talents. Like I have discovered that I can do live theaters, that I can um, sing a little. I'm not a singer like my dear friend Blanca here or um, Gabriela, but I, I can carry a tune. So they asked me to sing, I will do it gladly because I, I will, I'll always be like um, to entertain my friends. And in a way you have to love people and you have to really love interacting with others to be a performer. And when you come from broadcasting, you are pretty much a performer because even though I come from the news world, when you, when that camera lights up, you are on a stage of your own and you have to really put a performance by telling the facts and the truth, but you still have to come across with domain, with, you know, with um, personality. And I think that's what I bring to the table that that's why I feel very proud of my journey because I have not been afraid. When life has thrown me a court ball, I said, okay, let's start all over. What is my passion? One thing that I have been very fortunate is that I have always been able to follow my passions and make it become a reality. But I work very hard at it. It doesn't come out of, from the, from the skies. You have to work on what you really want. You can have the talents, but you really have to perfection it and, you know, uh, pulirlos. You have to really have, pa be passionate about what you do. And I think that's why when you have passion, discipline and believing yourself, everything is possible. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, of course, being able to believe in yourself is a huge part of it and having confidence. And I think in this industry, the amount of, of self-confidence and like building yourself up is so important because we're not always getting that externally. And, you know, as women and as Latin women, we have extra barriers. Um, and some of it also means that when, when there's a vacuum or where there's a lack of leadership, or maybe there needs to be a um, more programming or more resources, then we have to be the ones to do it ourselves. And um, Gabriela, you did that with Revolución Latina. And can you talk about your career and how Revolución Latina came to be and um, about the transitions you've made in, in your career? 
Absolutely. First, I'm going to go all the way back, circle back to Blanca when we talk about transitions and this being uh, uh, the Women's Month. I mean, as women, we are constantly transitioning. Our, in our lives, our bodies are constantly transitioning. Our hormones are constantly transitioning. So we have to adjust and reinvent ourselves as we go. And for me, starting out as a dancer, I mean, talk about reinventing yourselves. We know that the career of a dancer is not that long, specifically of a ballet dancer, which is how I began my path, um, classical ballerina. And um, when I studied here in the States, I was born and raised in Mexico and uh, studied in the States. I, I got a scholarship at San Francisco Ballet School and then in Seattle and I couldn't get a green card. So the directors from Pacific Northwest Ballet suggested I go to Europe. And that's how I ended up in Europe. It's like, okay, well, if that's what they're saying, then sure. And of course there were the, the talks with the parents about, wait, what are you doing? But you know, I knew I had to go look for something. And in Europe, I ended up in Vienna, in a German-speaking country, between uh, Austria and, and, and Germany is where I worked, looking for a ballet company, not knowing the language. But then musical theater got in the way. Talk about transitions. It's like, oh, I like this. I auditioned. I wouldn't get jobs. I sang because I could carry a tune, but I wasn't trained. So then what do I do? I start looking for a, a voice teacher. And transition into musical theater in that way and because of the classical training and that you know the ballet training is very disciplined and I thank my mother my parents up to this day for for putting me in that path because that discipline is what has held me through this entire career of mine and to where I am now but um so that I was well trained so I had a lot a lot of luck with booking jobs as a dancer and then became dance captain with my first musical theater production, which was West Side Story. And I was petrified of singing because I was Rosalia and had to start Puerto Rico you know, in, in America. And, but once those three, three shows got, you know, I got by and then it's like, okay, I own it now. So I had a beautiful career there. I never felt as an immigrant, I was just another ensemble member. And in Europe, you know, you have people like we were in Germany, but you have people from England, from Spain, from Turkey, from all these different places on one stage. Um, so that made it a, a big community, a big diverse community. Um, eventually, my, the last show I did was Chicago in Vienna in German, the first German speaking production. And I understudied Belma Kelly in German. So that was like, it made me feel very proud that I as a Mexican was in this mega show in German and understudied this major role. So I wow. always, you know, held that close to my heart. And eventually I, I came to New York and, and connected with the, with the casting company. And it was just a matter of time before an audition came through. And, um, and they hired me for a uh, swing and dance captain for the production of Vegas in Las Vegas of Chicago, the musical. That started a 10 and a half year career here in the, in the US with Chicago. I was always pretty much dance captain, went to different tours. I ended up on Broadway. Um, I went to Mexico City to play Velma Kelly in Espanol. So it was amazing to have been able to do this show in three languages. And one always amazing. kept, yeah. And then, and then the transitions, you know, I was a, a dancer, then dance captain, that means responsibility. And then when I came to the US, the responsibility of then training celebrities and how you work with that, I kind of became a little bit of a psychologist as well, because you have to learn how to speak to people, right? And make them feel comfortable in their own skin. Um, so that was, uh, that was fantastic. But then, you know, it's like, okay, I made it to Broadway. This is amazing there was something missing. And um, around that time is when I met Luis Salgado and we met on the set of Enchanted, the Disney movie. Um, we had lunch, had a really great conversation. He was doing In the Heights off Broadway. And then at that point, um, uh, about a year after, he contacted me and said, hey, you know, um, I want our community to know that they have representation in the Broadway stages. Would you want to do something with me? And I'm like, I'm in. Absolutely. Whatever you need. Well, this movement became something much larger than myself. And I think you mentioned something about being something larger than you, uh, Blanca, as well. And that moment is like, it made me feel like I really had something to contribute and especially to contribute to our community. Um, 
we did several uh, uh, programs and then ended up knowing that the way to empower our community was through the performing arts, through finding those underserved communities where those kids seven to 17 had no access to the arts. And we as Latino performers coming to them and saying, hey, look, there are some that look like you on these stages and also not for them to be stars, but for them to gain self-confidence, self-assurance, be better leaders. And when we saw how that impacted these kids, how a class, a voice class, they literally found their voice. In a movement class, all of a sudden they became freer. These kids came in like this and then they came out like that. And we said that that is our mission. So when we started doing this work, it was amazing. And that made my leaving Chicago much easier because there was a point, of course, I'd been there a long time where I felt, okay, this is the end. I've done here everything that I've had to do. And so um, I, I had to connect and tell myself that I was not Gabriela Garcia connected to Chicago the musical, that I was Gabriela Garcia and Chicago was part of what I did, not who I was. And once I became aware of that and thought, oh my God, I mean, there's so much more than I do. I'm co-founder of Revolución Latina. Then I was able to leave. And then it became just part of my mission. Now, our motto at Revolución Latina is dare to go beyond. Well, I remember saying sometimes that's a blessing and a curse because sometimes I'm like, I don't want to be go beyond today. I'm tired. <laughs> but it's like, no, you have to be an example. Um, and also because I remember... As a dancer, I would have never approached certain choreographers or celebrities, but as co-founder of Revolución Latina, I am like, hi, I'm Gabriela Garcia. Have you heard about us? This is what we do. This is our mission. This is the impact that we have in our communities. It became something so much larger up to this day. And that experience made me grow so much as a person, as a leader, as a everything. And I am eternally grateful because then this is how I can contribute as well to a platform like Ola with all the knowledge that I have and also personally transitioning. You know, when we dance a lot, the body gets tired. And then there's a point where I go, okay, I don't want to be ensemble dancer anymore, but how do I remove myself when everybody knows me as a dancer? So mm -hmm. when I left Chicago, I removed myself from the industry for about five years. I started teaching. I went back to my roots, started teaching ballet at Joffrey Ballet School and then got myself back into acting classes, prepared myself. And then eventually I reconnected with my agent. And then when I was presented, if you, if you will, again to this industry, I started being sent out for TV, TV roles or theater roles, but where they saw me as an actor. And then they went, oh, you dance too. And that was amazing that I had to make that choice to pull myself away, to be able to reintegrate myself to where I wanted to be seen and how I wanted to be seen. Um, and yes, navigating, I didn't know I was Latina until I came to New York. I was a Mexican dancer traveling the world, dancing in different countries. And then I come here and it's like, here's your seal. Your last name is Garcia. And it's like, okay, so let's, let's learn to work with that and adjust with that. Um, and now, like you say, I'm also in my act to Isolda, transitioning now in the 50s. It's like, where do I want to be? What do I want to do? And I do feel that the world is opening up. I feel that we're not putting, you know, la Latinas in a mold. I am now being seen for other roles. Now, granted, I have my, my gray hair now, but it's like, you know, just a, a woman that can uh, represent uh, a board member, a uh, casting person, a X, Y, and Z, not specifically the maid. So it's great that we get to navigate this in a world that's now changing, hopefully for the better. And um, it's just wonderful to see where we can go and how we can continue to contribute to our community um, through what we do. But, but if, if I may, uh, as I hear you all speaking, and I know we'll still have to hear from Ima, which is an amazing, extraordinary performer, Everything connects to the fact that we women are so uh, real, ready and able to evolve, to take challenges as they come, and that we are so many things. We cannot be just uh, classified as you are a dancer. You, for instance, mm -hmm. are a triple threat because you sing, you dance, you act, 
I so, direct, I choreograph, I narrate. Exactly. I'm not. <laughs> so basically, basically, we are, we are, we have, we are all enriched with so many talents, and sometimes we are not even able to discover it ourselves until we are faced with certain circumstances in life that push us to look further to discover all those jewels that we have been hiding or have inside us. So, and that's to me is amazing in the fact that before when you were in your forties or even 30 years old, your life was over. Now we are starting at 50 and at sixties, which is amazing to me. Yeah. I love that. I love that the industry overall, but just in general, we're having better conversations about the third chapter, the second chapter, that things evolve as we evolve and grow as humans, because we do become different people because of all the experiences we have and um, that you're able to transition into new, different or more robust forms of your career. I also wanted to just um, say that programs like Revolución Latina that are specifically reaching out to kids are so important. It was a program like that that got me out of my shell as a kid. You know, they they came to my school and my school was in, in Harlem. We didn't have an arts program. So this was the only way that I had exposure to being on stage, to getting outside of my shell, to singing, to performing, to learning to be big and bold and speak out. And there was this one, um, I had a gym teacher in elementary school who was amazing. I loved her. She was always pushing me to be a little bit more athletic than I felt like being always pushing. And I ran into her on the, in the train station and she's like, oh my God, I haven't seen you since you were a kid on the train. She's like, what do you do now? I was like, I'm an actress. She's like, what? You didn't even talk as a kid. And it was, <laughs> it was that painfully shy, but it was programs like that that brought me out of my shell and showed me where I found passion, joy, and purpose. And so thank you for being part of that. And I hope that that inspires folks that are watching that maybe feel like they wanna do something, they wanna be involved, they wanna start something to support programs like this or start ones of your own. And um, also, you know, like as, as Ola, uh, with Revolución Latina, we have the problem for, for emerging artists. So that goes 17 and beyond. And Inma actually has been a student of, of some of our workshops. Really? Yes, a proud, a proud student. I, I think I know you from the very beginnings of Revolución Latina. I Latino. think so too. Yeah. And I met so many wonderful people and, you know, sorry to just jump in, you know, but I've been listening. So, <laughs> just, <laughs> no, I love, I love uh, to see the, you know, how it started with a group of us taking classes, right, for actors who wanted to offer that opportunity and that was wonderful and how it had expanded into a worldwide phenomenon, right? And I'm so proud to, to always support it too. And uh, whenever I need it, I'll gladly provide anything that they need me to provide. So Marcia, do I say something now? Or what do you want me to <laughs> well, I know, want because I mean, Take it away, to Inma. Hey, because you okay, just so here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been listening and there are so many wonderful topics we've touched on. Uh, so first I'm gonna say I am a, a proud daughter, a proud granddaughter. I come from a, a lineage of very, very strong women. Um, truthfully, I identify at a soul level as a, you know, as a woman. I don't identify so much to nationalities or ethnicities. I am a woman, right? And respect everybody else. Um, and I wanna celebrate our greatness because you know we discuss here everything, right? Uh, and I don't even know where to go, but I'm gonna point to our braveness. We're extremely brave. We're extremely resilient. Uh, in my art as an artist, um, I just do what I love to do. I don't attach myself to titles. In fact, I wanted to be described in the photograph, like artist, but it's okay. They put actress, it's okay too. <laughs> so, and we have complete permission to do whatever we want to do. You know, if we want to be voluptuous, I love my voluptuous me. I love my skin <laughs> me. I love my, my, you know, not 15 year old anymore me because we are fabulous and Absolutely. truthfully we feel fabulous at heart the rest of the world will perceive us as such like sometimes i hear comments from other women i say i don't face those things and i think it comes from really knowing in, in your heart 
who we are, what we do. And if, you know, somebody says something that is inappropriate, we put them in their place, you know, <laughs> and we keep moving. And yes, I relate to what Gabriela said. I never really felt an immigrant until I arrived in New York. I always travel. I always connect with people and say, oh, yes, I'm from Spain. You know, that's um, what I was saying this. So um, I forgot why. Oh, I want to make a connection here. Because when I was growing up, uh, my grandmothers went to university and all of that. And they were like the only ones, right? So that's why my, my lineage is so important to me. And I didn't really understand why my grandmother had to put a lot of people in their place. Say, Perdón, está hablando con una universitaria. Yo soy Doña Pilar, no? <laughs> and, and I didn't really understand it. You know, I said, why does she have to be? And now here I'm in New York, and yes, I'm an artist, but as, me, as all of us, you know, and also, I also have degrees in English literature, believe it or not, with my accent. And I have to be reminding everybody when they say, do you speak English? Excuse me, I have a master's degree in linguistics <laughs> and English literature. So I made that connection. So I can't believe that, no, I have to repeat the story somehow, even if we move forward in life, but we still have to claim our greatness many times. And I guess, you know, I love men, women, I love everybody, whatever you identify with, but we still live in a very old fashioned society. Mm -hmm. uh, not us, of course, we're here, but that tries to always put us down. If it's not in one way, it's in another way, or, or it's in the representation. And that's why it's so important. You say, we need women behind the camera. We absolutely do. And I have friends who were like the first cinematographers in an all male dominated one. And they, they tell me 20 years ago, they were like the only ones. Mm -hmm. So now they, they are setting an example. So the same thing, we have so many programs for the performing arts. I'm gonna just say a call out to everybody watching. We need more programs for behind the camera, specifically for girls. Because they also need to see, oh, my script can get that. And, and I can be somebody who does the lights and somebody who does the camera and, and all of that. So I'm all for supporting, and I'll finish here. I know there is a lot to say about everything, but I'm all for every girl. And yes, I focus on girls because I'm a woman and you know, men have the rest of the whole world supporting. So, <laughs> and this is a women's so panel. Much. So every, every girl in the world needs to feel free, to feel respected. We still have a lot of violence going on in the planet. That's a whole other panel by itself against girls uh, and women in general. Uh, and we, we have to stop all of that. We have to live in peace. We have to live in love. We have a responsibility as artists to do these panels, to do in our art. Like that's why I only promote fabulous women. When I do my one woman shows, why are you choosing those women? Because I love them. So it's my creation. And I always pick women who broke barriers, who did what never else dared to do at their time. And I relate to that. And that's my own little revolution. You know, like, you know, I cannot be Mother Teresa, but I can be Emma from New York. <laughs> <laughs> De Sevilla yeah. para el mundo. Para el mundo. And we, and I finish it, you know, we do, you know, the all our spotlights that we highlight women, we highlight uh, minorities within the Latin X or Latine community. And we're just gonna do our part, whatever that is. And let's keep celebrating our greatness and give girls permission across the planet to follow their dreams, to do whatever they want to do. Even if we might think it's weird, let them be, let them be. And we might think it's weird, but who are we to uh, shut off anybody's dream? Let's support everybody's dream. Oh. And much love to all, and I couldn't be prouder to be in the presence of such accomplished super women. So let's let's keep the fight going. And yes, I call it the fight. It's not oh everything is fine. Everything is not fine. We need to keep going. So Absolutely. thank you, Matia, for organizing and Ola for inviting me. <laughs> oh, what how could we not Ima, I love your spirit so much I, I tell you that all the time and um you said something so good which is that we have to we have to be the the ones to tell, call ourselves powerful you know in some way I'm, I'm paraphrasing and it's true you know um the world doesn't always re like re like 
you know, tell us that. It's not always something that's reinforced if we seek it out externally. And so it's like being able to tell yourself, like, I am powerful. I am great. I am wonderful. Like, that's a big part of, for me, like my experience as a woman is constantly having to remind myself of my greatness because oftentimes that's not coming from external places. Um, and you said something else about, you know, how important it is to have more women behind the camera and um, something that came up in the research, like examining some of the top 100 worldwide grossing films, specifically in, 20, in 2007, the study found that when women, um, filmmakers were behind the camera that it meant that there were more there was more diversity amongst uh, the, the below the line um, crew and there was also more women and more diversity in front in front of the camera as well so there, there's something there there's something about um, our sensibility in leadership that makes things better we have and you know we have yes had, better Matthew better, better. it's Thank our you. turn now it is yeah. our turn we have we have so much power and so much capacity for love and empathy and nuance and um in so many ways we haven't been given the opportunity to be leaders on a broader scale and like what if like what could we possibly contribute when we are the ones in power um or in positions of power so thank you for bringing that up that brought up a lot for me um, and i think also in in the theater world too i'm starting to see like there's this all of a sudden this surge of, of uh, Latin, Latin stories that are coming to fruition. Hopefully we, we will get to see them on a larger scale than just a workshop or an off-Broadway show. But the, there is such need for that as well. For I mean, I'm happy to see that there's now uh, more and more, I see more uh, women uh, choreographers and more women directors. And it's a responsibility, like I feel as well, I'm collaborating with Jaime Lozano, in his uh, adaptation of Desaparecidas. He just had a concert where he presented the songs. And he said to me one day, and I hadn't thought of it, he said, when he invited me to explore movement, he's like, well, who else was I gonna call that has a Mexican background, comes from a technical dance world and knows American musical theater? And I was like, you're right. Who else would you call, right? And that just, it just gave me the sense of responsibility of, yes, let me continue to do my homework because I can represent many worlds and be able to contribute in putting them together. And I think it's so important for us to be able to be um, those tools, you know, to be able to bring something like that and, 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 and contribute to these new works. And, and tiny back I'm, to what, I'm sorry, uh, tiny yes. back to what uh, Ima was, was saying and what you just reassured, it, it's okay to acknowledge that, yes, you are great doing certain that you have skills that you're talented and that you're good at what you do at because sometimes well especially when we come from you know the, the this machismo machista world especially women that sometimes were just uh, su subjected to 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 the to the male figure they weren't even allowed to speak for themselves and never allowed to believe in herself and it's okay now that we have evolved and become stronger and more powerful to acknowledge, yes, I'm good on what I do. Like for instance, I always knew when I was in broadcasting that I was very good at doing live interventions, live transmissions. And I was proud of that. Oh my God, if Isolda can talk forever and improvise and she would love uh, breaking stories and Isolda because she's good at doing livers. So, you know, and, and, and I take that with pride, I don't say it because I'm conceited. So it's important to acknowledge that we are great. Like my friend Ima said, yes. Like the grandmother <laughs> said, excuse me, who do you think you're talking to? <laughs> it's okay to applaud and celebrate your own self. I'm sorry, Blanca. No, no, I, what I was gonna say was that I, I noticed that each of, each of us at some moment said something like, so I said to myself, and I just wanted to point out how important those conversations with ourselves are mm -hmm. in helping us to focus, in helping us to maybe put a name to a challenge or observing something um, that we can then identify and grab hold of and say, hmm, um, to be more specific, because that was just like a lot of word salad there. <laughs> but for example, I remember 
becoming 35 years old. And I had been doing voiceovers for, for quite some time. And, and when I was younger, I had a voice that was actually sounded younger than my chronological age. I had to work hard to lower my voice. And that's one of those things when you say to yourself, gee, uh, you know, I'll never get with those perfume ads because they always want a sultry voice and I don't have one. So what did I do? I would just practice. And then, you know, one time I had a cold, I went for an audition, I had a cold and damn if I didn't get that perfume ad because my voice was lower. And I was like, you know what? You'd better practice that. And I was 35 years old and I get this call from someone, I had a producer I had worked with for, for many years. He said, Blanca, I need someone just like you, but younger. Can you recommend someone? But it was for a voiceover. We're not talking about this. Mm -hmm. And I, I was horrified thinking I sound younger than my age. He doesn't even know how old I am, but he's thinking, I love what you do, but I want someone younger even though I knew I could be younger, that I could sound younger. Um, and so I took that as a challenge. And I was, I was like, no, that's, that's not going to happen. I, I'm not going to allow that to happen. So how do, I, how do I address this? How do I grab the bull by the horns? And I remember going to some other like ADR gig where they were actually looking for someone to um, voice over like a 20-something year old. And here I was, I'm in like 35 and people are thinking, oh, she's over the hill, right? Because she's a woman. <laughs> and it was me and three other younger women. And I sat there and I talked to myself in my mind and I said, you're going to get this. You are not going to allow someone else to take this because I knew that it was a, a crucial moment for me inside that I had to prove, no, that guy that called me up was wrong. I have talent. I have range. I can sound like a 20 something year old for the love of God. It's not like I'm 109. <laughs> and, and, and I've, I walked away with that role right there on the spot They you know, we auditioned, they called me and said, we're going to do it right now. And it's you. And I was like, okay. And what that taught me was that I was going to have to reevaluate my career periodically as a woman. Mm -hmm every so often. And that's what I've been doing. And over the years, I found things like, and for all of you folks, um, you know, looking into voiceovers, here's a tip free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> if they give you, if they give you two takes and they usually will, right. You'll do one and then they'll come back and say something like, okay, well this time do it funnier, bigger, whatever it is that they give you. Always keep in mind whatever that conversation you've had with yourself of whatever it is that you need to make sure you can guarantee for yourself. In my case, at that time, it was like, I'm not going to allow them to put me in some older age bracket because they'll stop hearing when, you know, they look at my face and stop hearing with their ears, which is all they're really supposed to be doing. So mm -hmm. for many years, anytime I got a second take, I wouldn't just do whatever direction they gave me. I'd also be like, and I'm always going to do one slightly higher pitch that sounds younger. I'll always do that. Even if they say funnier, I'll do funnier, but I'll do this other thing as well, just so that they will never forget that I can do that other thing. I've also found out over the years that in any other profession, usually as you get older, you get more experience, you're more respected, you have a more important place within that field that you can sort of lay back a little because your reputation will carry you some. Right. Honey, we got to work harder. Yep. We got to work harder. Yep. We have to work harder because I'm competing uh, when I do like ADR work, um, which is like background voice work on film and TV. You know, they're always looking for younger people because the people that they use consistently will age out or age older. And you'll always have those people have to have that experience, but they'll be always needing younger. And I'll be having to compete with them because when they only can hire six people, exactly. you know, a lot of times it's, it's the older folk that tend to be weeded out unless they suddenly have a scene in a geriatric hospital. <laughs> so I found, I was like, so how do I make myself indispensable? How do I do that? Right. You can only control what you can control. You can't make them hire you. 
But you can make sure that when you walk in, you're the most prepared person. You're going to do the most background work. You're going to kill yourself. They can do four hours of research. God damn it. I'm doing a day and a half. And it sucks. It sucks because you've been working so hard for so many years. But you'll do that and you'll keep working. But you have to have these conversations with yourself and you have to take stock, take inventory, not just of what you have that you can offer, but think ahead of what their needs might be and how you should transition to what they might need and work on it before it happens. Work harder before you need to, because they'll always know she'll come in and she'll have 15 pages worth of dialogue that she can use because she's done the research. She'll be able to walk in and talk like an emergency room nurse in 1900 in a poverty hospital in lower Manhattan. Right. Yeah. I've seen you do it. So I know. So, you know, this is something, this is a gripe for me, specifically the ageism in this industry and specifically for women, because, you know, the, the men, they age like fine wine and the older they get, the more they work and the more nuanced and, and intricate and, um, complicated their characters get to be and for I know that I've struggled with this idea that like there's so much pressure like okay I look young and I've always looked a lot younger than I am and so I'm like I have to do it now I have to get it now I have to break now I have to, and I and I know that I have a lot of like actor actress friends of mine that are in the same demographic that feel that same pressure and it's so unfair because we should be able to age gracefully and age gracefully in our careers and for our work to speak for itself. But I will say, um, I coach actors on the business side of things. And um, one of the one of my favorite things to do is coaching actors um, that are reintegrating into the industry after being away for a while, because they come in with this mindset that like, oh, I'm older. And so I'm not gonna be able to work as much. And I'm, I've, I've found that they're the, the clients that are the most successful because I'm like, there's a need because historically the industry has pushed people out and now there there's a this vacuum at a certain at in certain age demographics where we need other actors we need other artists at least in front of the camera right and so you can fill that vacuum if you position yourself right and so how do you do that and that requires so much more work and self-confidence and i hate that the industry has kind of pulled that confidence away from women specifically, you know, that that we, we don't get to age gracefully and be beautiful in whatever bracket we are in and still work and, and be able to like rest on our laurels and our, our accomplishments. So, so much of what you brought up, oh, brought up a lot in me and the stuff that I know that throughout my career, I'll continue to have to check in on, like you said, to check in and see what works and what can I, how can I leverage what I'm, what I'm good at? Um, because you're right, we can't, we can't change this big monster that is ageism in the industry, but we can adjust how we, how we show up. And I think, I, I don't know what it is for my, oh, so. no, no, no. I just want to say something funny, if possible, that <laughs> Always. Me, even when I was 14, I was playing a lot older women, right? So I know in a unique case and I always say, but I'm young, why do I, I say, oh no, you are tall, you have the mother, the motherly nature. So we just have to make it look in our favor. Like to me, I don't care, give me an 80 year old uh, role, I'll do it because I'm just happy to participate. But of course I agree with everybody, what you are saying, just embrace your beauty and your fabulousness and create your own opportunities. I, I don't give them that much power. I really don't care what anybody thinks. I know we all have to pay our bills. So yes, I have other day jobs and that's okay. And even in other day jobs, you might think experience pays off. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes new arrivals push you out and you need to go find yourself something else. And it's just part of life. And that speaks of our resilience. We keep going. And yes, they might say, you look too old. I said, no, I just look too fabulous, you know? <laughs> and I'm going to, you know, I know what life, so I'm just going to stay quiet. And you move on to the next thing. Okay? Gabriela, sorry. Yeah, you. no, absolutely. The same fashion. thing. <laughs> no, I was saying, I don't know if, if it's the 
it gets easier as we transition into another phase of our lives. Like when I was younger, I was thinking like you also, Matia, that, you know, do I look like everybody else? I look too young. How do I look this, that? And now it's just like, that is out of my hands. Yes, I am a, a piece of clay. I can mold myself to try and be what they are looking for, but my essence is me. So if the role says 40s, but they send me out and, you know, I've booked roles that say 40s and I'm in my 50s and have my, my grace, but something of what I did said, no, let's go with her. So you never know what can happen. It's not trying to fit into something. It's like trying to, to embrace what you're given and make it yours. And then the rest is not up to us. And that's how we can continue. And, you know, for those watching too, if you're not a member of Ola yet, be a member. We have some amazing workshops as well that can help everybody grow. And it's a wonderful community to be a part of. And also, I mean, look at all the different colors that we have in our directory. You know, we from every kind of um, Latino, la gama de colores, a rainbow of people because we are all different when we all have something to contribute. Absolutely. And talking, I might just add um, that that resonates with me because I don't think you cannot define, let age define you. It's really about your essence, your personality, your talents, your perseverance, and your security on what you bring to the table. I really have never, my mother always said, why are you always telling your age? You're making me look old as a mom. Every ah! stage has a role and I feel very proud. And I say it out loud and proud. I'm 61. That means that I have had a journey that had to take me to many levels. And in every, instead of saying, what am I going to do? I'm starting all over. I feel old. I never, it never crossed my mind. I just decided I want to reinvent myself. I wanted to continue being productive. And I just, uh, to the, um, the, 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 el toro por los cuernos. And I <laughs> jumped into the water and I started working and um, learning this new uh, field. And now, besides the journalist, I'm an artist. And it sounds beautiful. And I have to believe it. And yes, believe it. If you believe it, other people will believe it as well because it starts with you. And we all have something to bring to the table no matter what age we are in. And that's what I was sort of referring to when I say checking in with yourself, having those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, because only then can you really identify what those Achilles heels are and what you can control about them, whether it's ageism, whether it's language, whether whatever it is, what is your Achilles and what do you already possess strongly that can counter that, that you can use to your advantage? Absolutely. And to the creators in our audience that are watching, um, the, these stories as you age, as you grow and you live are the, the most delicious stories to tell. You know, I, I can't wait to be able to tell a story that's not about like a high schooler or someone who's like, just like entering college because there's only so much you can explore. There's only so much that you've lived, but there these stories as you've had a family, traveled the world, lived three, four different lives, had many transitions and many iterations and evolutions of yourself are the most delicious stories to read about, to write and to see as an audience member. So I encourage you to keep writing for women like these women here who are extraordinary talents. Um, we are at time. And so I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, um, not just for being on this panel, but for supporting Ola, for supporting our vision, our mission. Um, we wouldn't be here without you all and your support. And thank you so much for everyone who's tuning in. Um, join us for our next panel. We will be announcing what the next topic will be soon, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And let's finish this month celebrating women and never stop celebrating us. Every day is our day. How about that? Matthew? Absolutely. <laughs> Amazing. Great to be with you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you.